Okay, so thank you very much for these uh, for this opportunity. Uh, yes, I'm I'm going to talk about the the edge scaling limit of the Gaussian beta ensemble, and I think it's a great honor to speak in this seminar for many reasons, and and one of those is definitely that I think Lord Dumas is the is the total expert on on the edge scaling limit of airy beta things. So to be able to speak here especially is is nice. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a new analytic function that appears, random entire function that appears at the edge of the Gaussian beta ensemble. Uh, it will be called the stochastic airy function, and I'll give some context for where it comes from. Everything I'm talking about is joint with Gautier, who is here. Uh, and I have some pictures here. So, so the pictures that you're seeing are, are actually simulations of this stochastic area function, which would be the scaling limit, which is the scaling limit, which we have proven to be the scaling limit of the characteristic polynomial of the Gaussian beta ensemble. Uh, in these pictures, the red curve is in fact the, the stochastic area function. Uh, the green curve is the, is the normal area function. And then in the background, you see some, some, uh, some additional curves, just simulations of the same thing. And we've changed beta, and it will be a feature that, indeed, as beta increases, this becomes less noisy and turns into the area function. But this is actually unproven. Okay, so, so this is all about beta ensembles, specifically the Gaussian one-dimensional beta ensemble, which is a wonderful classical distribution. And I do think it really belongs in the sort of class of integrable systems, even though it's not quite like uh, standard integrable systems because so much can be said about it, but it generalizes the beta is equal to one and beta is equal to two and beta is equal to four cases, which are the classical ones. I guess everyone here is familiar with this type of formula, but this is the this is the density of those eigenvalues or those points. So this is just some joint uh, probability density function with this van der Mond structure to the beta. Uh, a large, lots and lots of things are known about it. So uh, there's a whole sort of, well, universe, solar system of things known about it. Uh, there's definitely three different types of scalings which which are common and which which will appear in twice in this type of, in this talk. Uh, there, there's a type of global limit, which is this functional CLT, where where you would take a function and sum it over the eigenvalues and subtract something and have convergence to a Gaussian. And there's a long list of people who have been involved in this uh, and who have produced theorems to that effect. Uh, also in the context of the Gaussian beta ensemble, there's a type of bulk scaling limit, which is uh, principally in the, in the general beta case due to work of Valko and Virag. Uh, this is this so-called continuum uh, Brownian carousel. And also there's a, a second paper about a type of operator that appears. And there's also a local scaling limit at the edge, and that's more or less what was going to be the, the the impetus, the inspiration for what we're doing here, and that's uh, that's due to a, a paper of Ramirez, Ryder, and Virag, and both of these subjects down here uh, operate or use this uh, this tridiagonal structure, which is going to be important in what I'm about to say. So, so I'll I'll define that properly, uh, but but it's all about things that can be done by taking limits of a certain tridiagonal matrix. Now, I'm actually going to talk about the characteristic polynomial. So very much of random matrix theory has been focused on the properties of eigenvalues of random matrices, and less so on the characteristic polynomial. So of course, in principle, you get the eigenvalues of a, of a matrix by studying the characteristic polynomial, but it's not necessarily the easiest way so the reasons for studying the characteristic polynomial have to be something else. And one of the main reasons that you might look at it is because of this uh, anticipated large n limit, which is a convergence of the characteristic polynomial to this object, um, which is in some sense the most standard random fractal that you can build. So this is the Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And there's a type of general conjecture, which is that if you take the characteristic polynomial, so that's this Vn, 
and you raise it to some power, and then you rescale it by its expectation that that would converge to a random measure. And there's a lot of work that's been done on this now, uh, in particular in beta is equal to two, where there's been a lot of success. Uh, in particular, there's work of Vera Sticky Webb and Wong, Clay's false Lambert Webb, which really settled this in some sense in beta is equal to two. Uh, there's also work on circular ensembles, which is parallel. And basically, there's no work in general beta, though there is this paper of Scheibe and Najnudel, where they they don't look at the characteristic polynomial, but they but they look at a related object. Uh, if this if this just looks foreign to you uh, and not motivating, I'll just say that this this object is really really nice. It's it's actually very intuitive. Uh, uh, it's it's a generalization in some sense of a very specific random fractal, which I really do think is is the most straightforward that you could create, which is this. Uh, log normal multiplicative cascade uh, due, due to Mandelbrot. Uh, the idea there is to do a construction where you just define a random density in probably the most natural way. You take some unit density and then you cut the interval in half and then you renormalize the density at, at one side and you renormalize density on the other side by multiplying by random variables independent of mean one. And in this case, we take it to be log normal, uh, so that it's a log normal cascade. And then you iterate this procedure by continually cutting the intervals in half. And so I've drawn this picture here. And then take a limit. And this, when it exists, is uh, is this basically this GMC. It's it's not exactly the same measure because the covariance structure is different, but it's very close. The actual GMC that would appear in a random matrix context is this one. Uh, it's a limit of uh, an exponential of some Gaussian analytic function. Specifically, it's a power series. Well, so this is a, this is a truncation of the power series, this WN. It's a truncation of the power series where we just take IID complex Gaussian coefficients divide by square root K and then form a limit of this measure. So this is the actual one that would be uh, appearing in the random matrix context. Um, the fact that this limit exists when gamma is less than one is basically trivial. I mean, the fact that this limit exists always is basically trivial. The fact that it's non that, that the limit itself is non-trivial is non-trivial uh, when gamma is less than one. And that's basically due to Kahan. Uh, there's also a critical point, which is the critical chaos, and you have to do further renormalization. And there's also a supercritical phase, which really needs to be understood as a type of uh, decorated extrema of a log correlated field. Okay, but this is the type of motivation, which is to see that the characteristic polynomial converges to the GMC. Um, <clears throat> And that's what got us, Gautier and I started on this. Uh, we have two results, and I'm basically going to talk about the second one, but I want to briefly mention the first one. Uh, the first one is just that if you take the characteristic polynomial and you take it away from the spectrum, so I tried to draw a little picture here, you have minus one, one, where the spectrum is, and then you look out in the plane somewhere, then, uh, then you can couple this characteristic polynomial to an actual exponential of a Gaussian field. And I actually should be dividing by something here. I should be dividing by the expectation of, of phi n here. The expectation of phi n actually turns out to be a, an Hermite polynomial, but that takes care of this type of the big behavior, the exponentially large behavior. The fluctuations of it are then, can be coupled to this, to this Gaussian field. Um, and this I put in the same place. I don't know if the picture was helpful, but this is a type of analog for the characteristic polynomial of the functional CLT that we saw on the previous slide. There's also edge convergence and bulk convergence. And the edge convergence is what I want to talk to you about today. So the edge convergence essentially says that 
if you look in a small window around one, and the window in which you look should be the same as what you would look in to see an airy function if you wanted to take the limit of the Hermite polynomial at the edge. So if you look in that same window, then you should see convergence uh, of an appropriately renormalized characteristic function. So we take the characteristic function, which is this characteristic polynomial, the characteristic polynomial, and we multiply by some deterministic scaling. And we can show a coupling, which is uh, between this psi n of lambda and the stochastic airy function at spatial parameter lambda. And this is a new object. So I want to talk about it. Um, in some sense, you could imagine that it existed before, but I don't think it was ever really worked out exactly what it should be. And that's true in any value of beta. So this is a, this is a new random analytic function always <clears throat> for any beta. Uh, that would be the edge convergence. There's also a bulk convergence that you could talk about, and this would just be conjectural at this point. Uh, there are, in the cases of beta 1, 2, and 4, some analytic functions that have been constructed, entire functions, which would be the limit of the characteristic polynomial. And that has been shown. Uh, but there's also a general beta version of this, which is very recent, due to Valko and Virag again, um, uh, called the stochastic zeta function. And, and uh, it's a funny story. This, this appeared... This appeared on the archive the very same day that Goti and I put our paper on the stochastic airy function on the archive, and there was no, no, <laughs> no planning involved in that. We had no idea we were both doing that. But in any case, that happened, and so it appeared at the same time. So there's there's the stochastic zeta function, and we would certainly conjecture that that the characteristic polynomial of G beta e converges to it. Um, but that's certainly still open. Okay, so I want to start by telling you what this is, this stochastic airy uh, function. So it's a new object. It's a new object. It's a process. It's got two parameters, lambda and t. Lambda will be a complex parameter. T will be a real number. It is itself a solution of the stochastic airy equation, which has been pretty well studied for a while now. And the stochastic airy equation it's this one. So this is a second time derivative uh, of this phi lambda t is t plus lambda phi lambda t. So this is the airy part of the equation. And to the airy part of the equation, we add a perturbation, which is square root 4 over beta phi dw. W is white noise. Um, if it were the simple airy setup, it wouldn't matter that we had this shift in lambda here. You could actually transform the lambda out of the equation, but you can't do that here. Okay, so this is the stochastic area equation. Uh, let me show you just some simulations of it because I want to illustrate something. So this is the stochastic area equation running forward in time, beta 1, 2, 4, and 16. Uh, the green picture, again, is the area equation, uh, sorry, the area function. And red is uh, simulations of the stochastic, uh, uh, sorry, of a solution of the stochastic area equation with initial conditions that match the area function. Uh, the point I'm trying to illustrate is that in all these pictures, the solution of the stochastic area equation diverges, it blows up, it has Berry type behavior, it has exponentially growing behavior as you go forward in time. And that's a probability one statement for any beta, for any initial condition, fixed initial condition, this would occur. Now, that's not good because we're really looking for a solution that looks like airy. And there's something you have to do to make sense of this, which is reverse time. So if you reverse time, you can get sort of the physically relevant solution. So in that sense, you want to go out to a large positive time and you want to run the equation backwards. And then the airy part, the stochastic airy part, will become stable. And so you see that we're getting solutions which are 
reproducing something that has sort of airy type behavior. Now, this is a picture in time. The pictures on the first slide were pictures in Lambda. So it's important that we run this in reverse time. And there is a small technical issue with that because we're talking about an Ito equation and it may be in principle difficult to reverse time, but there's a way to fix that or to avoid that. And that's to recast the stochastic area equation as an integral equation, which will no longer be an Ito equation. So the following integral differential equation, it's actually really just a Volterra equation for the derivative V lambda prime, is equivalent to the first one. Uh, it may not look particularly intuitive, but it can be achieved by integrating by parts. So you can take uh, the stochastic area equation and integrate it uh, and produce, produce this u function, which has some deterministic part, uh, and then a difference of Brownian motion at two points. And it's also nice that the lambda dependence also separates, and you get this lambda t minus u. The initial conditions integrate into this in a funny way. So the C2 will correspond to the initial value of the derivative and C1, the initial value of your function. The most important thing I want to point out about this is that it's just a plain random integral equation. So there's no issue with running time forward, running time backward. You can start it with random initial conditions. That's fine you can define the solutions always without an issue of measurability. When you have fixed initial conditions, you can rederive the Ito equation uh, that, that governs this uh, stochastic area equation. So this allows you to really freely go forward and backward in time, and this is the way uh, that for many things you need to think about it. Uh, actually, for proving stuff, it's, it's much more helpful to, to use this. But. Um, this is a perturbation of the airy equation itself. So stochastic airy looks like airy. Uh, so if you take beta to infinity, the noise term that would have been here disappears and you're just left with the airy equation. That's helpful to realize because you know, for example, that the fundamental solutions of this, a set of fundamental solutions could be given by airy at t plus lambda, berry at t plus lambda. And airy and berry have these well-known asymptotics, or rather, I guess you could say, airy and beta are those solutions that have these well-known asymptotics. Um, so what is the stochastic airy function? So much like in the airy equation, it's possible to define airy up to a normalization as, as the bounded solution of, of the area equation. And in stochastic area, you can do the same. So define the stochastic area function up to, up to constants as the unique solution of the stochastic area equation, which is bounded. And bounded here, I mean in a compact sets of lambda, but for all time. Now, it's not obvious that that even exists, so you have to say something about why it should exist. And how we actually do it is we're going to uh, determine how it must behave asymptotically as t goes to infinity. So this, this might be even viewed as a type of theorem, but actually it's almost a definition. We're going to evaluate the, the time going to a positive infinity asymptotic of this so I need to fix some Gaussian process. This is an X. I'm having great fun taking all the LaTeX letters that are fancy and then writing them by hand. So this is, this is an X. And X of U is the uh, square root 4 over beta times this, this particular integral. I don't suppose it's supposed to be particularly meaningful, but it is just a Gaussian process. It's a nice Gaussian process. And it needs to appear in the time going to positive infinity limit of stochastic area. So we can now specify that SAI lambda t 
is going to be the solution of the stochastic area function, which has the property that locally uniformly in lambda, as t goes to infinity, this function behaves like t to the minus one quarter, one plus two over beta. Uh, here's the airy part, which is really the same. The t to the minus a quarter is also an airy part. Here's something that's different. You have this Gaussian process, which appears here. And the integral of this Gaussian process is a log correlated process. And then there's some beta dependence, which appears this two over beta essentially compensates for the mean of the exponential of minus x. And this is some sort of extra constant, which we've put for the sake of beauty. Um, in principle, it could be not there. So a theorem, this function exists because now we've chosen how it should go to infinity, but it does exist and it's unique almost surely. So this, this is really a well-defined object. Um, some of this is forced. This has to be here in some sense. We can't remove it. Uh, you could, of course, re renormalize the entire thing by multiplying it by a random variable, but this process needs to appear. So that's, that's in some sense, uh, real, physical. Uh, this, this, is, this is a convention, and also this, uh, this t to the minus uh, one quarter times two over beta needs to appear. Um, but we've chosen things so that uh, heuristically, heuristically, as beta goes to infinity, SAI lambda t should converge to airy t lambda, t plus lambda. I put this as a question because we don't actually have a proof of this, but that's how we've set it up. So hopefully it's, it is the beta generalization of the airy function, the stochastic airy beta generalization of the airy function. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me say a few properties of this uh, of this function. So a few elementary ones right from the top. Uh, lambda maps to SAI lambda t is a random entire function. It certainly may not be obvious, but it more or less follows immediately from the fact. Okay, well, I won't scroll back, but it more or less follows immediately from the fact that the lambda dependence in the equation is and is entire. So this is an easy statement to make. Um, the other point is that uh, this is C, it has a time derivative uh, because it's a second order equation. It has a time derivative and its time derivative is a, is a, is a, is a, is a function whose uh, continuity properties are the same as Brownian, whose regularity properties are the same as Brownian. So C, C one half minus epsilon. Okay, maybe a, a less obvious one is that this process has an invariance in law. So the Brownian motion, or rather the white noise that defined the whole process has a shift in variance. If you shift time by moving it forward by some value of X, you preserve the, uh, the Brownian motion, or rather you preserve the white noise, excuse me, in law. And because of that invariance in law, you get uh, an, an, uh, an invariance in law of the stochastic area function, and it's not hard to prove again. It's just that uh, if, you if you shift time backwards by some amount, you should shift lambda forward by some amount. So these appear uh, together, the t and the lambda in the equation appear together as lambda plus t, so maybe it's not surprising that if you shift one by x in one direction, you have to shift the other in reverse. So there is this invariance in law in this process. The other uh, absolutely key point is that the, uh, the zeros of this equation, which appear in decreasing order, so is, there is a rightmost zero of the function lambda maps to SAI lambda t. The zeros of that are an instance of our favorite airy beta point process. So an airy, when beta is two, it's, it's the airy process, the airy point process. And, a, and for general beta, it's also 
the ARI point process. Um, because of this shift in variance in time, you actually get an entire family of curves. Oh dear. Okay. You actually get an entire family of curves where these, uh, these, as you increase time, tend to go down. So each slice of this, uh, each slice of this process for a fixed time is a copy of the airy beta point process. I thought it would be nice to show a picture of this. So here is a picture. This is a contour plot of of the stochastic airy lambda t function. These gray contours are the zeros of this process in lambda. So you can see that they roughly statistically move down like minus t, which is consistent. Um, these other level lines are just other level lines of the function. So this happens to be one where it's positive, and this happens to be a place where it's negative. Um, so each slice, if you slice this way, would be a copy of Airy beta. So you look at the intersections as you go across each of those, uh, each of those points, rather that point process is a copy of Airy beta. Um, this is beta is equal to two. Also show some other beta because something interesting happens. When beta is equal to one, you get something that looks more boxy. You get this nice square effect. Um, and I just was so interested in that I had to show a smaller beta. So here's beta is equal to 0.1. It's really becoming boxy. And I suppose it, it means that there's some type of, well, the only other picture I've seen that looks like this is, is PNG, that there should be some type of PNG limit, but that's just a conjecture. It is, however, consistent with the, the work of uh, Dumas and Labbé about the Poisson point process appearance of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, that there is a type of, uh, well, that there is in the beta going to zero limit some type of Poisson process appearing here. Um, maybe even it follows from their work. I'm, I'm not sure that would, that's an interesting conversation to have. Uh, so I'll just leave it as a question though. Is there a limit of these contour lines as beta goes to zero? All right. Um, I think that I probably won't talk about this. So I'll just say what was going to be on this slide. There are connections of the stochastic airy function to the stochastic airy operator of uh, that has been studied before. And this also has uh, implications for the perturbed BBP setup. And these are all very interesting, but I have too much to talk about. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to skip this. So if, if we would like to talk about it later, I'm happy to do that. But, but there are connections of, of stochastic airy to the stochastic airy function, excuse me, to, to the stochastic area operator and also to the stochastic area operator with different initial conditions. So the standard Dirichlet initial conditions are the ones that give the airy beta point process, but there's also Robin conditions which give this uh, perturbed BBP rank one uh, type point process. Okay, uh, I want to say at least where this equation comes from. How does the stochastic airy function arise? Well, the easiest way to see it, and certainly the way we've proved it, is to go through this tridiagonal representation. So I'm going to let A be an infinite tridiagonal matrix where I put normal random variables down the diagonal and I put chi distributed random variables on the off diagonal. So these are chi's with an increasing parameter beta times j, uh, and it's symmetric and it's infinite. Now, I guess it's a relatively well-known theorem that, that if you take a corner out of this matrix and you look at the eigenvalues of that corner, you see um, the, the g beta e, the Gaussian beta ensemble eigenvalues. And so because of that, you also see the characteristic polynomial, if you take 
the determinant of z minus a over square root four and beta, where we, we were looking at a minor of this. Um, in order to make the connection to the stochastic area function, I want to augment the probability space. But once I augment the probability space, there will be only one probability space for the remainder of the discussion. So this x is going to be the a value. So the a value would be the one on the diagonal, a divided by square root two. And I just do that to make it mean zero variance one. And y is going to the, be the off diagonal entry b squared minus its mean divided by its standard deviation. So these are both mean zero and variance one. And we can then embed those processes, or not embed rather, but couple those processes to Brownian motions. <clears throat> and we do that using a standard KMT type uh, coupling, which will make this uh, partial sum, the sum K running from one up to T of XK close to one Brownian motion, and the sum of k running from 1 up to t of yk close to some other Brownian motion. These are independent Brownian motions because x's and y's are independent. Uh, of course, in fact, x is actually normal, so, so this you can actually just embed inside of this. Uh, but for y's, you actually need to, to have an approximation. Once that's set, we have a single probability space. So let me at once explain the main heuristic for, for how the stochastic area function occurs and, and also state uh, a theorem. The characteristic polynomials, phi n, phi n minus one, as a pair, uh, satisfy a three-term recurrence. And you can write that in matrix form, which, which I like doing. If you write it in matrix form, what you see is that uh, that the expectations have a well-known uh, format. So the expectation of phi n, uh, phi n minus one, is just this matrix times the expectation of phi n minus one, phi n minus two. And this matrix is in fact the recurrence matrix that you would need in order to generate the monic Hermite polynomials. And in our normalization, it's the monic Hermite polynomials orthogonal with respect to e to the minus 2n squared x squared. And that's just so that if you take little n equal to capital N, uh, you would see a semicircle law for the, for the zeros on minus 1, 1. So this is type the, basically the mean behavior of this recurrence, and it's actually the, the most important part, the order zero, if you will, behavior of this recurrence. And the recurrence itself, the random recurrence for the G beta E characteristic polynomial is essentially a perturbation of it because we take variance one random variables and we scale them down by square root N beta. So the actual recurrence is in effect a perturbed version of the deterministic one. So we need to capture the behavior of the deterministic recurrence in order to be able to answer what happens to the perturbed one. Well, the, fortunately, that's, that's well known. So it's a standard asymptotic that if you take this, this wonderful function here uh, of z, which is just growing exponentially and it's got some nice 1 12th powers in it and things like that, that if you take pi, the monic Hermite polynomial, you multiply by w, and you look at an index which is close to n, but it can be a little bit less, so it's down by t times n to the one third, and you look at a spatial location of one plus lambda over two n to the two thirds, that converges to the airy function at lambda plus t. And I say all this because this w is the same w that we need in order to renormalize the stochastic airy function. So if I take the stochastic area function and I normalize it by the same thing, I can write out its three-term recurrence, and I hope you'll trust me on this, that the three-term recurrence approximately becomes the following, that if you take psi n uh, hat minus two psi n minus one plus psi n minus two, so a type of second derivative in little n, then this is approximately 
um, some deterministic multiple of psi n uh, plus a random multiple of essentially psi n minus one and psi n minus two. And it's not so hard to argue that this is becoming the stochastic area equation with in fact a quantitative error, which is some big O of n to the minus one sixth. So the whole point is that the three term recurrence of this renormalized set of characteristic polynomials is becoming the stochastic area equation with an error. So that much was clear and that was the basis for lots of work on, on uh, the airy beta process. Now I can tell you what we're proving. So we're going to take this same function with the same renormalization. Um, we can't just take it by it itself. It's not set up properly to take the limit yet uh, because there's a giant Gaussian random variable that we have to renormalize by. This is a G. Again, I'm, I'm having fun writing the letters. This is, this is my attempt at a fractor G. So this is a GN. Uh, and I'm dividing psi n hat by this exponential of g, and I'm also multiplying by the expectation of that. Uh, g n is explicit. I don't know if I want to say too much about it, except for to point out that we more or less know exactly its variance. Um, the variance of it is uh, is exactly. Oh, I can't write the g. Okay. is uh is uh log n uh and i think it's ooh, two over three beta maybe it's one over three beta i think it's one over three beta <clears throat> okay so but anyway the point is that it's big uh it's big and it's here this process is now set up correctly to take the limit. Uh, and so this is the object which converges. And so our main theorem is that psi t lambda uh, on this probability space that we've constructed minus the stochastic area function at lambda t converges to zero almost surely. And that's in a relatively strong sense it's in the sense of being uniform on compact sets of lambda and of time, but also in, in uniformly in any number of derivatives in lambda. And that was important for us because we also want to be able to say, for example, that the zeros converge. So we want to be able to talk about derivatives, at least the first derivative. Okay, but we also have higher, higher derivatives. Now, there is a technical point that I should man mention here. I, we're only able to do this for real values of lambda. So this is convergence as a real analytic function uniformly in its derivatives. Uh, in principle, there's a tiny uh, n-dependent range of imaginary lambdas that we can do, but it's not interesting, I think, as, a, as part of the formulation here. Um, the other thing is that this gn is more or less independent of SAI lambda. Uh, gn essentially has to do with portions of the recurrence which don't influence the limit. So in an appropriate sense, you can renormalize it and have it disappear. So that's what I've tried to formulate here. So if you were instead to look at uh, the log of psi n hat, uh, cancel the gn which has to be there, cancel the expectation, the log of the expectation, and then divide by square root log n, um, Uh, then, then you would get convergence to a normal. Uh, actually, I see that I, I made a mistake. This, this should, uh, this should not be here. It's, it's like this. So, if you take this characteristic polynomial, renormalize by a giant factor, subtract this expectation, divide by square root log n, you get convergence to a normal random variable. But more than that, you also have that psi t lambda converges to SAI lambda. And this process is independent of this random variable. So all of the, 
all of the, the well, this essentially this factor of square root log n kills the dependence between them. The dependence is somehow on a smaller order. All right. So let's see. So I should finish in about five minutes, right? Five minutes. You, you you can you can take a bit more if you want uh, so as, as you want. Okay. Well, let me let me at least say what we had to do to make this happen. So I'm just going to give you a bullet point of of what actually has to happen because I mean at this level we have this heuristic which is that here's the stochastic airy equation and we already know and it's been known for a long time that psi basically satisfies the stochastic airy equation up to an error. So we would like to turn that information into showing that we actually get convergence of the characteristic polynomial to SAI lambda. So what do you have to do? So um, the most important thing is that we have an efficient way to represent solutions to the stochastic area equation. And we need to know things about that. So, so we introduce a kernel, which is a, a random function, of three parameters, this is an a, a lambda t u, which is some kind of mixture of f's and g's. Um, f's and g's are specific solutions of the stochastic area equation with fixed initial conditions. Uh, they're the Dirichlet and Neumann solutions, so you just fix a particular base time, zero, for example, and look at the uh, the, the Dirichlet solution at zero and the, and the Neumann solution at zero. So F is Dirichlet, G is Neumann. It's not hard to show. This is a random entire function in lambda. There's two applications we have of this. Um, the first is to actually define the stochastic area function itself. We want to take a limit of A lambda, and we would like to do that by sending one of the time parameters to infinity. So we're going to send a time parameter to infinity and show that locally, uniformly in lambda, it converges. So what we do is we first have to understand very well the locally uniform limits of, uh, of f and g. So we take Dirichlet and Neumann solutions, and we precisely give their behavior as time goes to infinity, and we do that on compact sets of lambda. If we identify that, and we identify it explicitly, then effectively we can define SAI lambda by taking a limit where we send one of the time parameters off to infinity and just divide by that behavior. So this won't get the behavior exactly. There's a random constant which is missing, but this is philosophically what we're doing. So, so that's one thing. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing that we can do with this kernel is that we can represent solutions to a forced stochastic area equation in terms of the kernel. So that's how we're going to actually show that you have a convergence of the discrete equation to the continuum equation. The discrete equation is an approximate solution of the stochastic area equation um, with some kind of error term. So I've written it in an integral form, but... <clears throat> But the difference of the discrete stochastic area equation and the continuum stochastic area function would satisfy some type of uh, linear equation like this, where you have this kernel, which is the sort of key fundamental kernel of the stochastic area equation as an integral, as an integral equation. And then you have an error term. And this zeta is some small thing, but it's only small like n to the minus one sixth. So what you then have to do is you need to represent the solutions H, which is the difference of the discrete equation and the continuum solution, as, uh, as, uh, as an expression which involves the stochastic airy kernel. So this is the key. This is this A right here, which is the function defined above. And in fact, we need some derivatives of it. So these are derivatives that look like this. So the, the message is this. Uh, zeta we already know to be small because the discrete equation is an approximate solution of the continuum one. Uh, we need to bound this kernel because if we can bound this kernel in an efficient way, 
then we can actually say that the differences of the discrete equation and the continuum one can be controlled by both the size of this and the size of zeta. So zeta is easy to control, uh, and this one is hard to control. But it can be done, and so one of the, the, the main challenges here is to, is to show that, that this can be bounded basically by something which is sub-polynomial in capital N with overwhelming probability. I'm, 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 there's some extra functions you need to put in here, so it's not quite a supremum bound. But in the appropriate norm sense, this should be sub-polynomial in N. This is N to the minus a sixth, and so the difference will be N to the minus and sixth plus epsilon. The other point is um, a lot of what we need to do can be reduced to understanding this object, which is the Riccati uh, transform. So the Riccati transform, and it's really ubiquitous in everything that there is to say about the stochastic airy, uh, the airy beta equation. It's the log derivative of phi t, where phi solves the stochastic area equation, and it solves a one-dimensional diffusion. Um, more or less, we need to know a couple of things about this, but everything we need to know has to do with the large time behavior effectively. Well, okay, there's two things we need to know about it. One is the large time behavior, uh, specifically exactly how it converges to this parabola. So. So as you send time to infinity, this Riccati equation tends to, to cluster around a parabola y is square root t, and we really need to know how close it is to that. Um, and the second thing is we need control on how frequently it blows up, some kind of moderate deviations bounds on how, how frequently it blows up. Um, we need to get an order of accuracy high enough so that it's possible to integrate it. So the, the accuracy, um, or, rather, or rather the asymptotics of Dirichlet and Neumann solutions can be understood from the asymptotics of this log derivative. Uh, but you have, to, you have to get an error bound which you can integrate over all time. So this is kind of the key asymptotic to derive, which is that the integral of the Riccati has this big deterministic equation uh, behavior, which follows from the fact that you have this uh, this square root sort of leading condition, some type of logarithmic correction. Uh, this Gaussian, which is the same Gaussian which appears in the in the behavior in the in the limits the asymptotics, excuse me, of the stochastic area function, and finally some constant. So this is the type of asymptotic that you would need uh, as t goes to infinity followed by s. So that was one of the things that needed to be shown. And then this leads to an overwhelming probability bound on, uh, with, with some other parts, to an overwhelming probability bound on the kernel also. You need to also control how frequently the process blows up for that. I'll just say one final thing about it, which is that after everything, you still need to very well know the initial conditions. So. We, we are running the stochastic area equation running from large positive time backwards. And you need to know that where you start is close to airy initial conditions. And that actually, uh, that actually required Goti and I to do a completely separate project where we show that the initial conditions are close. And this is a different paper, the, uh, the, the behavior of the, uh, the global part um, or the hyperbolic part of the recurrence. It's a different part of the recurrence, but this is somehow making sure the initial conditions are close to airy. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have way too much to say. I just probably should just stop at some point. Um, I'll go to my final slide. Uh, I will mention that there are, there are people who have been working on related problems. Um, in particular, Raphael, who is here. Uh, there's also work of Burgard and Payne. And there's a recent paper of Johnstone, Koczka, Vonatsky, and Pavlishin about central limit theorems for the characteristic polynomial. And that has a large, a strong, uh, that is a strong technical and, and mathematical similarity to what we're doing, 
So we're all also interested in the, the sort of order one behavior of the characteristic polynomial. <clears throat> we, have, we have lots of things that we don't know how to do. So we, we've created a stochastic area function. We've shown that it is the limit. Um, there's lots of questions still about what should happen, both qualitative questions and, and theory questions. Um, so all we've shown is the stochastic area function is the limit of the characteristic polynomial. And built into how we did it, we needed to take the t going to infinity behavior of that. So we know very well the t going to infinity behavior of the stochastic area function. Almost every other limit that you can take is something that is interesting and not known. So there's the beta going to zero limit, which should have something to do with this PNG picture. There's a t going to minus infinity limit where you should see the oscillatory behavior. And in particular, it'd be interesting to know the actual decay rates as t going to minus infinity. Do you see a t to the minus a quarter, like an airy? Do you have a beta correction? I expect that's what, what should happen. Um, the lambda properties as a process in lambda properties are harder and uh, a very natural one is just to know what is the large lambda behavior of this process. Uh, there's also the, the large negative lambda behavior where you should see some type of convergence to the stochastic zeta function. There's a beta going to infinity question where you should see airy, the stochastic airy beta should become airy. Um, this, I think, it's it's, well, I, there, there should be an easy proof, but I don't know what it is. Uh, there's a moment question. Uh, there's definitely a universality question. So we've done something for G beta, for Gaussian beta. Definitely, we think that it should hold for other beta ensembles, one cut regular, say, at the neighborhood of the edge beta ensembles. Uh, there's an eternal question of how to connect this to other uh, integrable systems knowledge in particular and beta is one, two, and four. I'll also add potentially KPC. Um, and I will just finish by saying that we, we, we hope to eventually use this in understanding the bulk scaling limit of the characteristic polynomial. Because of the structure of how the characteristic polynomial is made, in order to say something about the bulk limit, you have to start by saying something about the, uh, the edge limit that's actually, it feeds in as an initial condition. Okay, I'll stop there. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for this beautiful talk, Elliot. So uh, b before uh, we ask questions, uh, everyone can unmute themselves if you want and, and thank Elliot. I have one question, but maybe I, I will wait if the participants. Okay, let, let me ask my, my question. Uh, you have this uh, stochastic ERI kernel. Can you build a determinantal point process uh, having this kernel? And uh, should it have uh, some interpretation? Should it be related to this, the, the zeros in time of the stochastic ERI function? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah, so I think as beta goes to infinity, uh, and maybe Gautier can weigh in on this too, as beta goes to infinity, um, I think this becomes... This, this kernel is not... Uh... The operator it's associated to it is not uh, a nice operator. I mean, it's it's a kernel of a Volterra equation. I mean, it it, it doesn't define a determinantal point process. You see, it's not between it's not uh, between zero and one necessarily. It, it's not the analog of the Airy kernel. If you want. It's constructed out of Airy and Berry functions, so it's not the 
maybe the name we gave to it is, uh, is misleading in this context, but... Uh, oh, so, so it doesn't go to Eric Arnel as beta goes to infinity? No, no, no. No, it will go to the kernel, which is Ari at T, Barry at S minus Ari at S, Barry at T. Okay. The kernel yeah. the Ari equation, not the kernel of the Ari point process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I, I mean, in principle, you can build uh, a Airy kernel. That so it's not the one we sh we showed, but you can build a stochastic Airy kernel. And I don't know if it's uh, if it has the right um, reproducing property to, or the norm bound to automatically define a. Oh, this one uh, does, yeah. Process. It does. This okay. Yeah. If you, if you yeah, but, yeah, you can take stochastic Airy lambda, stochastic Airy prime mu, or. Uh, how is it? It's airy, airy, airy lambda, airy mu, or something like that, divided by lambda minus mu. Can I okay. say something? Okay. Sure. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the airy kernel for the point process is the kernel of the projection of the airy operator on, uh, on the positive uh, half line, I think. Uh, and, uh, well, or on t to, uh, to minus infinity with our convention anyway. You, you can do the same thing for the one of the stochastic area operator and that would define the determinant of point process. This is the one Elliot was mentioning, but I, I mean, this, this process would be weird. I mean, it would be like a determinant point process in a random environment in a sense. I mean, I, I don't know what, what it would have as a property, you know. But but it, it reminds, it would, there there yeah. are some examples, right, where you randomize the kernel and you actually get back the original process. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but it, it's slightly not, not different. Sure this is one of them, but <laughs> so no, it's yeah. I don't know. It's it's uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe it is actually. Yeah. I mean, uh, in expectation, it it should be the very process. In expectation. <laughs> so so can I ask another one? Do do you have a can you describe the zeros in the time for fixed lambda of the, the stochastic area function? Um, we have a little bit to say about them. Yeah, so if if you fix a time um, and you count, you look at the counting function of how many zeros there are, uh, then this has to be the same distribution as the counting function at a fixed time of airy, uh, the area point process. And that's based more or less because of this invariance property or or or, uh, or or by looking at it as a stern Liouville problem. Um, I think as a process in time, I don't know if we have something to say about it. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, so I, I would be surprised if it's the same though. So this is the picture. Uh, I would be surprised if it's the same. Maybe it is, I don't know. It's the <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this would be that slice. Okay. So, yeah, Guillaume, you should think of the time as the time is really like taking minor of the matrices in a sense. I mean, it's, it's what it is, it's the operation. It is it's a corner process, and yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Lo. <laughs> no, it's just about uh, so about the bug behavior. So you expect that. Um, some of your result can be translated to, to this case so that you can have the convergence of uh, towards the stochastic zeta function. That's that's right with uh, your methods. And your oh, uh, I I would not. Yeah, we definitely don't know how to do it. Uh, we have a um, well. Let me let me make two answers. So so one question is if you take the stochastic lambda, a stochastic airy function and you send one of the parameters to minus infinity, so you're looking more and more in the bulk, then presumably this should converge to the stochastic zeta function. And I don't, I don't have any way to show that. I don't know how that would go. That's a very interesting question. 
Now, on a separate question, there's can you show the convergence of the characteristic polynomial to stochastic zeta? So that, in some sense, is an extension of what we're doing. So we're analyzing the transfer matrix recurrence and we're coupling it to, to Brownian motions. And we know now more or less the input into the um, into the dynamical system that that you need to run in order to show stochastic zeta convergence. So it's a separate problem, but we know the initial conditions that need to happen for it. Um, it's not that we can adapt uh, the methods here to prove it, but we can use the methods here or the results here as an input to start that particular project. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the for the question. Oops. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's he is, yeah, he is not available on that day. <laughs> are there other questions for Elliot? I, I have actually another one about the, the part that you skipped, uh, the relation to the stochastic array operator. You, you said the, that uh, the stochastic array function provides a, is a diagonalization of the stochastic array operator, but is it uh, in the sense that uh, if you take all the uh, lambdas, uh, it's, uh, it's a basis of the space on which the, the stochastic array operator is defined? Yes, yes, thank you. It's uh, exactly so. So stochastic array uh, lambda t um, can be can be used to create a, a basis. Uh, what is the basis of eigenfunctions? So the uh, time becomes the sort of uh, space parameter there, and you would fix lambdas. You would fix lambdas. So for example, let me look at this bullet right here. If you take the zeros in lambda of stochastic array lambda, uh, and you look at this process as t goes uh, as t goes from zero to infinity, then by definition these functions are zero at zero, and this set is a complete family of eigenvectors of the stochastic array operator with Dirichlet initial conditions. You can also do the same with Robin conditions if you look at rather the lambdas, which are the solutions of stochastic array zero equaling to some w times stochastic array prime at zero. So both of these are well-defined functions. If you look at the set of lambdas which solve this, then these things become the eigenvectors of those. And so we have, in fact, a complete diagonalization for all Robin conditions and for all lambdas and for all times. And, and then can one write some uh, spectral decomposition? Can, can this help to tell more about the, the stochastic array operator? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I, uh, I don't know if we really have a lot new to say about the operator. Um, it might be possible to say more about BBP, uh, where you do higher than rank one because we have very detailed information on, on the, uh, the full uh, spectral decomposition of the operator. And in some sense, you can write this as a type of, um, well, you can build an operator on top of the stochastic area operator with Dirichlet conditions, or rather in terms of the stochastic area function. So it might be possible to say something there. Um, but I don't think we, I mean, I guess we can say more about the eigenvectors than was known before. So, so there definitely have been theorems, and I'll probably um, omit somebody if I try to, to list it, but there, there definitely have been theorems about the eigenvectors of the stochastic array operator, including in the original paper, there were, there were theorems about the stochastic, the eigenfunctions. So, so now we have very precise information on, on what the eigenfunctions do. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there uh, other questions?
So, okay, I think there, there are no further questions. So thank you very much, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.